chapter 12 of Luke, verse 49. Jesus says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. That was a given, but they threw that anyway. But no, I'm just just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) And he was also saying to the multitudes, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. But why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you are going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him in order that he may not drag you before the judge. And the judge turn you over to the constable and the constable throw you into prison. I say to you, you shall not get out of there until you've paid the very last cent. And you read this at the, on, on the surface, the first time you think, what on earth is he talking about? There are several things in here that you think just are out of sync and out of character uh, with Jesus even. And so we're going to look at this today within the context of the conversation and what he's been saying. Remember, when this was written, And when it was spoken, (laughs) there were no chapter breaks. There were no verses. Even when it was written, there was not that. They put that in later when they canonized the scripture. They put in the chapters and verses to make it easier to find things. So let's go back to verse 49. He says something very interesting. I've come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it was already kindled. That's shocking. You read that on, on the surface. If you were asked this morning, as we came in, maybe during greeting time, what do you, why do you think Jesus came to earth? You could say probably a couple of things that come to mind. In fact, they say specifically, I came that for this reason, right? Maybe one of those things would be, I know Jesus said, I came that you might have life to the fullest, right? Y'all know he said that, right? That's one. Or I came not to be served, but to serve. How humbling is that? And how, what a blessing that our Lord came to serve. Those are some of the reasons he came. But here he says, I came to cast fire on the earth. And then the second half of the verse, how I wish it was already kindled. So some sources, those who comment on these things say that Jesus was saying, how I wish the father would send a fire of divine judgment on the earth and those who come against the things of God. And that thought is even offensive to our ears and hearts to hear. Or some say, maybe it's just that he knew the judgment was coming and he wanted to get it over with, the judgment on sin, which is going to be placed on him. And he wanted to hurry that process along. I wish it was already kindled. Or is he talking about the fire of the Holy Spirit? John the Baptist said, there is one coming after me who will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. I believe he's talking about all of these meanings in this. Jesus must go through the fire of judgment on the cross so that the fire of the Holy Spirit will come to empower his children. That's what is the beautiful, gory glory of the cross. As awful as it was, Jesus had to go through that So that, and that fire of judgment, so that the fire of the Holy Spirit would be available to his people. When reading the Bible, you need to make sure that you're reading the text within the entire context. And we've learned in recent weeks that Jesus, in chapter 12, we've been seeing, he's been in the middle of a large crowd. It says early in the chapter, they were pressing in on him from every direction, all of them wanting something from him, right? Maybe just to touch him, try to be healed or whatever it may be. So within that crowd are those who believe and those who don't believe. Those who are his friends and those who are his enemies in the same crowd. 
So he addresses what each of them needs to hear. Remember, he is God in the flesh. And as God, the Lord Jesus knows he can share one message and it can speak to different people. The same message, the one person hears it one way and one hears it the other. For example, he told them, and this is earlier in the chapter, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Paraphrased, get right or get left, <laughs> right? When an unbeliever hears those words, they push back and scoff. Come on. You know, God is loving. He's not going to do something like that. Come on. <laughs> There's no hell. Maybe for the devil, but, you know, good people go to heaven. They push back and they, they compromise. The skeptic, you know, argues that point of the scripture. But Jesus has compassion for them. So he wants them to know that they are in mortal and eternal danger of hell. So he tells them the truth. But when a believer hears those same words, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do but I warn you whom to fear. When a believer hears that, they get excited because they know their faith is secure in their Savior. When I read those words to y'all, if you're in Christ, you know you heard that and you thought, oh, wow, Whew, thank you, Jesus. You died in my place. My, my, uh, my faith has found a resting place, as the old hymn says. Not in device or creed. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. So the believer looks forward to meeting him face to face. Whereas before we were in Christ, we may have dreaded that. We did dread it. And it was that fear of God, healthy fear of God that drove us to the cross. And said, so, Lord, I need a savior. I can't save myself. I am facing you as judge. I don't want to face you that way. I see that you passed judgment on my sin on the cross, Lord. So I'm going to face you as your child. And so you hear it within, again, the same crowd, the same words, hear it differently. In the next verse, we get more insight into why Jesus started this conversation this way. He says, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. It's the baptism of God's wrath. This is not a water baptism. This was a baptism of fire. James and John's mom said to Jesus as she noticed how James and John were kind of in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, right? Peter, James, and John. And so she came along and, and she said, you know, I've noticed my boys are really doing a lot of benefit to your ministry. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that you like them a lot. And since that, I, I want to just ask a favor. Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, this is from Matthew 20, may sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. And of course, she's thinking very earthly, right? She's thinking a literal kingdom like so many in Jesus' day were thinking, of course. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He's talking about the baptism of fire on the cross. Referring to his death. And baptism is a picture of death. When someone is baptized in water, we're baptizing them and we say they're going into this watery grave. We talk about how baptism is a picture of our dying to the old life, coming out of the water is a picture of us being raised back to life in Christ. Jesus said, I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. The baptism by fire on the cross was the fire of the Father's perfect judgment on the Son. God became, was made, was born, raised, grew up, and died, born as a man, so that he could die. Well, that's elementary. We got that. But understand, the cross is a baptism of fire. The fire of God's wrath, and he's sharing this 
And with those in the crowd, again, some believers, some unbelievers, the fire of God's wrath will inundate Jesus. The fire of God's wrath will consume him. All of the sins of all humanity throughout all time will be poured out on Jesus. This was the fullness of hell itself. He said at the end of verse 50, until it is accomplished. What is accomplished? The wrath of God. The full, complete, perfect wrath of God. Wrath is anger towards sin, anger towards death, anger towards the fall. The wrath, it's perfect judgment that God pours out on the cross. And it's interesting that he says in the last part of that verse, until it is accomplished. I believe that's saying he can't wait to cry from the cross. It is finished. It'll be accomplished. He knew from the beginning of time, he is eternally preexistent with the father, father, son, Holy spirit, timeless. He knew this moment in time was the pivot point, the defining point of all history forever. And he knew how hard it was going to be as man to go through that because he knows how bad sin is. He knows how dark it is. He knows how separation from God feels. He even prophesied it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As God, he knew it was coming as man on the cross. And he was quoting from Psalms 22, from the Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that same Psalm, I prophesied how they divided his clothes. He knew it was coming. He knew the wrath was coming. Yet as man, he felt what we feel, the dread. He said, take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And so that perfect wrath, he cries out from the cross It is finished, satisfied. And the it is finished is a word for us this morning because the devil likes to whisper in our ears, you know, you're still, you're still a sinner. You know, you'll never get free from that. You know, he'll he'll remind you of, of things you did or said or thought, you know, you're always going to carry that. That's always going to be you. No, that doesn't characterize you. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do we still have things that rear their ugly head? Things we say, think, and do. And we think, ah, yes. But we surrender those to Christ and say, Lord, thank you that I have victory over that. And the devil wants to say you don't. Remind the devil that you do. (laughs) Because it is finished. All your sin. The ones you'll commit today and tomorrow. (laughs) That sin is finished. It's accomplished. The wrath has already been poured out on that. Oh, well, I can continue in my sin. No, you know, in the conviction of the Holy Spirit, if you're in Christ, you're not going to have that attitude about it. You're going to have an attitude of, thank you, God, that I'm free from that. I'm not bound by that. Thank you that I can walk in your freedom. It is finished. So it is accomplished. And he was looking forward to that. And then it says something interesting in verse 51. Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no but rather division. And each one of these verses is like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Is this Jesus we're talking about? He's looking forward to hellfire judgment. No. He's looking forward to, to death and hell being defeated. But then he says, I bring division. But I thought you came for multiplication. <laughs> you send them out by two and they lead two and those four lead two and that's eight and that's 16, 32, 64, 128. It can't go higher. <laughs> it's, it's the multiplication of the gospel. That's how it works, right? He's not into division. But he says, I bring division. But didn't the angels declare when you were born, Jesus, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We're coming up in a few months. We're going to be singing that in church. That's peace on earth. Yes, and when someone puts their trust in God to save them through Jesus, they make peace with God and a supernatural peace enters their heart. That's the peace of God. That was the peace on earth that was accomplished at his first advent. But peace throughout the whole earth will not happen until his second coming. That's when peace on earth throughout the whole earth will happen. Until then, humanity will be divided because of Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him 
There's no in between. Oh yeah, Jesus is good, but so is this other God. And you know, that person's sincere in what they believe. So, you know, they're good too. No, Jesus divides. You're either for him or against him. There is no in between. And he, spe- he gives an example. They will be divided. It says, for from now on, five members in one household will be divided. Three against two, two against three, and they will be divided. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. The most divisive question in the world is this. What will you do with Jesus? The most divisive name in the world is Jesus. It brings division. Each of us likely has family that we are simply not close to because we are Christ followers. Each of us can relate. Friends who used to be friends until we came to Christ, and now we're Jesus freaks. Now I just don't get you, man. (laughs) What happened to you? Well, you're either for him or you're against him. That's why he said in verse 54, he was also saying this to the multitudes. When you see a cloud rising in the West, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out. And when you see a South wind blowing, you say, it'll be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? The present time he was talking about was right here, right now, when God in the flesh is talking to you, you're not analyzing it because you don't know the scriptures. You're missing it. If they had known the scriptures, they would have known that the time for the Messiah was at hand. The scripture had already told them that he was not coming to bring worldwide or even national peace. Scripture didn't say that. The scripture said that he was going to be despised and rejected. The prophecy says that he would be numbered with the transgressors. The prophecies about Jesus said that he would bear the sins of the world. And just as there were many prophecies, over 300 Old Testament prophecies perfectly fulfilled through the life of Christ, not one of them fell short. All of them were exactly right. Likewise, in our present time, there are many prophecies that foretell of his second advent as well, even serving as reasons to believe that Jesus is coming soon. This gives us a sense of urgency as we hope to discern this time. Let me give you a few of those. Pardon me. The prophetic stage is set for a rebuilt temple. The Temple Institute, you can Google it. The Temple Institute will tell you all about the artifacts, the pieces, everything is ready. The only thing they lack right now, they even have the priest in place. Men who've grown up, who've been um, prepared to serve as the priests according to the perfect letter of the Levitical law in the Torah. So the prophetic stage has been set for rebuilding the temple necessary to fulfill all the prophecies of the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist will go into the temple and completely desecrate the place. The Lord tells us through Matthew, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And in 2 Thessalonians, it says this, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God. Where? In the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. No nation in the history of the world has ever been established twice. In AD 70, The the Roman emperor Vespasian destroyed Jerusalem and the great dispersion of the Jewish people occurred and the temple was completely leveled. The nation of Israel as a place and a recognized nation ceased to exist. The people of Israel all over the world, of course. But then in 1948, because of the atrocities that happened to the Jewish people, the nations of the world got together and said, you know, we really need to try to help Israel 
and established them as a nation again in 1948. They became a nation again. Again, the only nation ever to be reborn as it was. And today, the hopes of a rebuilt temple continue to rise among the Jews, especially those who are more religious among the Jews, who have the Temple Institute in mind and all that. Another prophetic sign, the prophetic stage is set for the sort of world-dominating alliance of nations, uh, uh, pictured really in the old Roman Empire that we had before. It'd be like the new Roman Empire. It will likely be connected to the modern European Union of nations arising out of the goals of the leaders and really arising out of the chaos of our times. The stage is set for that as well. Another, the prophetic stage is set for a political and economic world leader to arise. The sort of single political leader who will lead this world dominating confederation of nations. The prophetic stage is set right now for the kind of false religion the Bible says will be characteristic of those last days. And then one more. The prophetic stage is set for the kind of economic system predicted for the very last days. The technology is available. Have you noticed a rise in AI? A little bit. And the need is definitely getting more and more present. And many say that it's going to, uh, an economic crash will be the the perfect timing for the virtual money to come on the scene. We already have virtual money. You know, um, you have a lot more on your Venmo than you have in your pocket, <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, that, that virtual exchange of money, it's already in place, but currency, really fiat money, uh, but currency, paper money, coins are still used but likely what will happen is an economic crash that will set the stage perfectly for implementing the whole economic system of the new world order. So just a few of those prophecies uh, that um, we need to make sure that we are not like those of Jesus' time. They didn't recognize him the first time because they didn't study the word. They didn't study the scriptures. Let's be students of the word so we recognize the signs of the times. Verse 57, and why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you're going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate on your way there, make an effort to settle with him in order that he may drag you before the judge and the judge turn you over to the constable and the constable throw you into prison. I say to you, you shall not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. Don't wait. I can paraphrase this for you. Don't wait until the last judgment to come to Jesus. What he's saying is there's judgment coming. There is a fire of judgment coming. Yes, there was judgment on Jesus at the cross. There's a final white throne judgment where everyone who is not in Christ will be judged. You don't want to face that. You don't want to face God at that point. You will not face it if you're in Christ. The only judgment you'll face is the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is where our works are weighed and burned off if they're completely selfish and want recognition of man. You know, he'll say, reward us for the works that are done out of love, out of obedience. So don't wait until the last judgment to come to Jesus because as this parable here he shares at the end is saying, you won't get out ever. Why? In that last, very last cent or very last penny you might have in your Bible. The point is, he's saying, because you can't afford it. We're all debtors to Christ. We're all indebted to a degree that we cannot pay. That's why the song says he paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I cannot pay. Now, Jesus did what I can't do. I can't afford perfect righteousness. I'll never have that money, <laughs> that spiritual bank account, but he has it completely. So he says, make sure that you're not counting on your own righteousness is the message. Make sure that you don't, you, that you come to Christ like, like now, settle it with him, make peace with him. Someone going to court, walking to the courtroom, they don't want to go before the judge. If you had an option in any kind of legal issue with someone, 
you had an option of settling out of court or going to court, which would you choose? We all would say settle out of court. You never want to go before the judge. And that's what he's saying. Settle it first. Don't go before the judge. You can't afford it. Jesus here alludes to the idea that there is a price to be paid, and that price is hell. Remember, he just said that in the same conversation. We've been looking at it for four weeks, but he did this in five minutes. <laughs> it says, till you've paid the very last mite, penny, cent. This reminds us of a fearful yet biblical truth that hell is forever. It's eternal. Because payment for sins is required, an imperfect humanity can never make a perfect payment required by a perfect God. So the Lord here, again, as you read it on the surface, out of context, it's like, I'm so confused. He's saying things that contradict what he said elsewhere. But you look at it in the conversation, look at it in what he just said, look at it in his heart for humanity. It is his will that everyone be saved. Christ divides. Just his name separates between those who embrace him, those who put their trust in him for salvation, and those who reject him. Yet he came and he died and he lives again for all humanity. It is God's will that no one would live forever separated from him. And the great news is, whosoever will may come to him and receive eternal life. He will not force himself on you. He woos you by his Holy Spirit. He says, come to me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open, I'll come in to him. And your peace with God that passes all understanding will fill your heart like peace you've never known. And he'll never leave. And that's why he says there is a fire coming. There's a fire coming, a fire of judgment. I've taken that judgment on myself. And here he's prophesying it. He's saying, I want, I'm ready for that baptism. I got to go through it. I know that that's I'm going to destroy darkness and completely disarm the enemy on the cross. And how I wish that I could go ahead and do that. Because then the fire of the Holy Spirit will come to my people, my family, my children for all time and give them a glorious entrance into heaven, into eternity. And we'll have a celebration in the wedding supper of the Lamb. What a beautiful time that is going to be. Amen. Well, let's all stand. And let's pray. And Lord, as we're bowed before you, we want to first, Lord, just say thank you. Because we know it is just the grace of God. It is nothing to do with us. It's all you, Jesus. The fact that we heard you when you spoke. And you even gave us the strength to say yes to you, Lord. You gave us life so that we could have new life. And Lord, we are eternally grateful for that. Lord, we know that the cross, even your name divides. And so Lord, our prayer is that you would grant us the grace when someone is hateful, unreasonable towards us, that we would know it's not about us. It's you, Jesus, living in us that brings division. Lord, grant us the grace to pray for them, to intercede for their soul, that they would know the love and grace and freedom and forgiveness that comes through knowing Jesus. Lord, I thank you for 
this fellowship of believers. I thank you for their love for you, their love for the word, their love for each other. And God, I pray your blessings over them as they go into this week as lights in a dark world, as salt in a dying world to bring you glory. And as through Jesus we pray and all God's children say it. Amen. God bless you.